So, um, well, Ben was talking about materials on the verge of self-destruction. I'm going to talk about people on the verge of self-destruction. Um, so, we should be questioning concerning photography, and in so doing, we should like to prepare a free relas relationship to it. The relationship will be free if it opens our human existence to the essence of photography. I must work on my Heideggerian stand-up routine. Um, anyway, that was a modified um, quotation from Heidegger. Um, this presentation is concerned with an aspect of photography about which little is known. It is the latent image. Latent, meaning hidden, is the invisible image left on the light-sensitive surface during exposure. The action that makes the photographic image visible also destroys this hidden image, sacrificing it for the sake of visibility. It is rather thought-provoking that the original and genuine photographic image is something invisible to the eye and unknowable. It is equally intriguing to consider the complete absence of the latent image from any critical and theoretical discussions of photography. Perhaps this is not surprising. Theory, from Greek theorea, meaning to see, to observe, theory is concerned with the visible. Western metaphysics is the metaphysics of light, legibility, and clarity, and photography theory is no exception. It wants to know nothing about that which is hidden, unknown, invisible. So we are reminded of Heidegger, who says mm -hmm. in What is Metaphysics? quotation, if science is right, then only one thing is sure. Science wishes to know nothing of the nothing. Ultimately, this is the scientifically rigorous conception of nothing. We know it, the nothing, in that we wish to know nothing about it. Heidegger has a great sense of humor. <laughs> Following Heidegger, I want to ask, what is, the la what is this latent image of which photography wants to know exactly nothing? I want to approach this question through a case study of latency in order to lay bare the metaphysics that govern traditional understandings of photography and in order to point to a possibility of another theory of photography, the theory of the unknowable image. So I'm going to show you some latent images. Yeah? Okay. The faith in representation replaced for the modern man the faith in the immortality of the soul. And light replaced God as the main technology of representation through which objects are owned, bodies are subordinated, and spaces are colonized. So I'm going to tell you the story of Andre Arctic expedition to the North Pole in the hydrogen balloon. Perhaps you have heard of it, but it is such a fascinating, sad, and tragic story that it is worth retelling. In 1897, an expedition of three aeronaut explorers took off from Spitsbergen Island abroad an aerostatic balloon aiming to reach the North Pole. Niels Strindberg was the designated photographer. The three, André, Frankel, and Strindberg, never came back. More than 30 years later, in 1930, the remains were found by the crew of a Norwegian vessel on White Island, some 300 miles short of their destination. And next to their skeletons, they found five rolls of, un of exposed but undeveloped film. And this is, uh, as far as I know, this is the longest known case of latent Im images kept in the latent stage. Here you see exactly um, the, the red line, the continuous red line, is the balloon journey. Um, the 14th of July, that's where the balloon crashed on an ice sheet. And from there, the explorers continued on foot on the ice sheet for a while until um, they perished. Um, so the question is, of course, I mean, the, the more theoretical question is, I'm going, of course, to betray my 
aim by showing you these images because I am um, going to show you representations. So you can already start sharpening your pencils. Um, but what I'm trying to suggest is that the latent image is not found somewhere outside of representation, but precisely within it. So I hope that you will be able, uh, you will kind of, you are willing to follow me on this journey. But in order to make it slightly easier, I will try to tell this story um, in the style of the theater of the absurd. Uh, because I think that absurdist poetics allow a certain way to imagine how it is possible to have the invisible or the unknowable present within the, rep the representational space. Because after all, a theater is a representational space and yet it can be used to produce something absurd. So here they are. Um, Frankel sitting, standing, standing, and Andre is the one with the yellow hat. So in 1897, Andre convinced the Swedish Royal Society and the king himself that it would be a marvelous idea to sail to the North Pole in a hydrogen balloon. At this time, Sweden was overtaken by other countries in the race to the North Pole. In particular, the annoying Norwegians overtook them with Nansen's expedition. Something had to be done to restore Sweden to its pride, and André was the man of the hour. With funding from the king and from Alfred Nobel, the inventor of the Nobel Prize, um, André acquired a marvelous balloon built especially in Paris to his specifications and secured two fellow travelers to go with him on this journey. So I want you to think, uh, just, just to, to explain this plan, while others uh, were trying to reach the North Pole, uh, you know, with the dogs and gradually eating the dogs as they progressed, they had this fantastic idea of just sailing above the North Pole at some strategic po point, dropping the Swedish flag, and then continuing to either uh, Alaska or to Siberia, then having a wonderful reception with the king and coming back as heroes. They even had kind of white, white gloves with them in the balloon and all the silk attire so they will look presentable uh, when they land. So that, 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 that was um, the plan. So this was an attempt to reach the North Pole by air and to conquer the landscape purely through visual observation. So this is, you know, visual culture, pure and simple. For that reason, photography was as important to the expedition as being the first to reach the North Pole. The balloon provided the perfect opportunity to aerial photography, which was supposed to significantly assist with accurate mapping of the territory. The André team followed here the logic of the Aristotelian space, divided, distributed, and ordered according to the laws of proximity and differences of degree. They set out to conquer a territory, to record, catalog, demarcate, and measure, all with the help of uh, photography and stereography. The hydrogen balloon is not only a method of transportation, it is also a raised platform for perspectival monocular surveillance of territory. The aim of the expedition was not only to reach the North Pole with relative ease, but also critically to use the elevation afforded by the balloon in order to expand the field of vision. By climbing up, it was hoped that the team will be able to gain a better point of view, to see further into the distance and to dominate the landscape through accurate measurement and mapping. So here you have the classic understanding of representation, visual representation and photography as a way of conquering space. If you like, it's kind of the, the typical colonial gesture of photography. So we have here, I think, two sets of practices the performative praxis of reaching the North Pole and the representational praxis of transferring the journey onto paper with the help of measuring instruments, drawing and photography. Mapping the territory means transcri transcribing a four-dimensional space onto a two-dimensional space. A map 
is a collection of lines, circles, letters and numbers. But these inscriptions can later become the instrument with which subsequent expeditions will be able to conquest and take ownership of the distant land. The practice of representations through measuring, photographing and recording is inseparable from the struggle for power and from the political and economic forces that have vested interests in the exploration of the world. The landscape, as it is seen from the height of the balloon, is represented as data, disassociating it from the lived experience of the freezing air, the expanse of ice, and the darkness of the polar night. The representations produced by Andreas team, which include meteorological, meteorological observations, were intended to be used later um, in order to repeat the journey. Photography played a key role in the mission to explore as much as possible of the North Polar region in geographical respects. That's a quotation from their mission statement. Uh, Strindelberg's camera was equipped with a device that allowed to record the position and altitude data directly on the exposed film. This, coupled with a wide-angle lens, was supposed to produce an aerial photographic map of the North Pole. That was Act 1. Act 2, in which the three friends find themselves floating on an ice sheet towards their death. That, by the way, part of this equipment, all the chronometers and all the ob observational devices. However, all of that changed when they find themselves on the sheet ice in the Arctic. The order and hierarchy of representation give way to the monstrosity of difference. The space they found themselves in bore no relation to the maps they brought with them on the journey. Maps have edges, boundaries, borders. They tell how far you are from where you are going. They allow you to plot a path over a territory. But what the Andre team discovered was that they are in a space without precise limits, without enclosure or measure. Since the conquering, territorializing function of the expedition collapsed, they came face to face with a monstrosity of nomadism, when maps fail and the notion of the horizon becomes meaningless. There is no role to play for vision because even light itself, the founding principle of enlightenment, reason and the will to know, light itself is suddenly something else, not the conduit of knowledge and the essential connection between the human being and being, but a terrible wall of light that causes the laws of perspective to collapse. Here I'm drawing on um, Barbara Ball's article, um, Shedding Light for the Matter, in which she describes a similar experience uh, in the Australian desert. Uh, the wandering distribution they found themselves in is not the perspectival space of the Renaissance, nor, I nor is it the political space of constitutional democracy that determines areas of control and order according to the degree of separation from center of power. Representation of space and political power are, are cl closely related to each other. Both depend on the principle of external heteronomous authority. As the stability and hierarchy of representation collapsed all around them, they came face to face with difference. In this movement, in, in this movement of deterioralization, de they ceased to be the messengers of the king and the parliament, the bearers of light and values, and became nomads without belonging, chain of command or external authority. The expedition that started as the projection outwards of the will to represent, to proceed organically from the center to the periphery, became, after the landing, intensive, self-contained, deteriorized. They wanted to bring identity to the North Pole. Instead, they found themselves in a state of radical difference. Amazingly, they continued to take photographs. And these are some of the images that, we, that were developed 33 years later. The, the, the story of the recovery of these images became a PhD um, uh, in the, written in the University of Westminster, which is a fascin fascinating document in its own right. But that's almost, I'm not going to, go to get into the recovery of these images. But I just want to start to think a little bit about the kind of mindset you need to be in when you land with your balloon on a sheet of ice with nothing by, but this white expanse all over you. And what you do, you take the camera out and you take some pictures. What I want to suggest is that what we are looking he at here is not so much a representation of the balloon and the gondola, but a certain 
state of madness induced by fear, by the knowledge of imminent death, by, by incredible pain. And the pain, as you know, is the closest unrepresentable thing to the representable physical body. So, try to understand, try to think about this, the function photography fulfills in this moment of, of helplessness. Um, and I want to suggest that here we are really in the presence of the latent image. The latent image, meaning the hidden image. Yeah? Who is hidden in this image? They are hidden. They became hidden. They are latent. It's, it could be, according to the logic of the theater of the absurd I'm trying to propose here, it could be that when you become detached from the center of power, from the state, when you become nomad, when you become hidden, then the hidden image is your representation. The hidden image corresponds point for point for your own sense of being lost. It could be, of course, you know, the classic explanation of these images is that they kept taking them out of commitment to the scientific discovery, out of the commitment to the project with which they um, departed, and, you know, through this um, unimaginable bravery, self-discipline, and all the rest, they continued to document their journey. That is kind of the, the rational explanation. But as we are now in the space of the absurd, I want to suggest a, a, a different reading. The reason they continued to take these photographs was not in order so one day they will be found and discovered and developed. What are the chances of that when you are on a sheet of ice? The reason they continue to take these photographs was because the, the, the act of exposure became more important than the image. It's the exposure that, in a sense, holds the body together. I mean, what, what do you need to do when you are in this white space? You need somehow, by whatever means, keep separating your own body from the environment you are in. The body keep wanting to disintegrate. Your fingers freeze and break off. In some accounts of uh, these um, explorations, people just bite their fingers off and sometimes chew them. And that's partly because they eat so much um, liver, um, a white bear liver, uh, that they get um, vitamin A poisoning, which induces madness. And in this state of madness, people cannot tell anymore the difference between themselves and the bear. In one of the documented um, North Pole, um, um, that, that's what actually in, in the Antarctic, one of the explorers tells the other, tell me if I'm a man or a dog, because they ate so much dog liver that they are completely mad. Um, in this state of madness, I want to submit to you, photography starts to perform a different function. It's not anymore about the image. It's the northern exposure. And the exposure to which the body is exposed um, somehow corresponds to the photographic exposure. Photography here starts to, be, to, to perform a kind of life-saving function because as long as you have this photographic exposure in your disposal, you can maintain the cohesion of the body at the face of the immense white landscape. That, obviously, was taken with a shutter, uh, with, a, with a timer, yeah? That's the, that's the, um, there is the sledge and a boat, the tent they erect. Just imagine how they spend their time. Another thing to bear in mind, they didn't plan to land on the ice. They basically departed from Sweden in their hunting costumes. Cotton socks, little hats, no gloves. Um, and then they find themselves in this environment. Look, no gloves, yeah, as you can see, standing there as if just, um, you know, went for a hunting expedition um, for a few hours. 
uh, posing next to a dead bear. That's André, the engineer. And these are, these are some more of the images recovered. That's the ice. And I want to take you to one of the most amazing images of all. They're on the ice. They, they spend some time there. They shoot some seagulls. They make uh, food. They make some notes in a diary. This, I think, this where you can really start sensing insanity. This is mad. That is the journey they're undertaking, pushing this heavy boat through these rocks of ice towards their death because there's nothing else left to do. And yet, they put a camera on a tripod. They put, they cock the shutter, they put it on a timer to take a picture of themselves pushing this boat through the ice. That, I think, is a performance. And perhaps that was the intention from the start. Perhaps that was a theater performance, <coughs> performed in the ice, 500 kilometers from the North Pole, for the benefit of nobody. This is art brute in its most brutal. And if you can see, you probably cannot read that, but uh, what it says here is an automatic photograph, uh, Frankel's sledge with a boat being pushed across a wall of freezer ice. And a, an automatic photograph showing all three men uh, so the uh, so the left Frank to the left Frankel to the right Andre in the middle Strindberg, from a film taken by uh, Andre in eight, in 1897 and developed in Stockholm in 1930. Yeah, so here you are in the presence of real latency. So what again? What I'm trying to direct you to think is that what we see here is not the representation of three people pushing a boat, but something else. We really can sense here the latent image itself. We are in the, in the presence of the latent. André and his comrades created a nomadic space by first executing a Heideggerian leap, then occupying a floating plateau of ice. The latent image is the image of the nomad. How can it be otherwise? A more representational image requires stability, order, systems. The nomadic nomos involves a plurality of centers, superimposing and mixing perspectives, first from the hydrogen balloon, then from the sheet of ice. The result is a distortion of representation in the visual field. Could it be that the André team, who pretty much knew that they are not going to get back, made these latent images because their rupture, their darkness, their monstrosity corresponded point for point with the monstrosity of their own situation? The undeveloped image within the total darkness of the film canister was, was for them an accurate and realistic continuation, extension of their own monstrosity. It is therefore possible to conceive of these photographs not as the representations they became after 33 years of lying in the snow, but as the aboriginal dot paintings that do not work representationally, but rather trace the circular movements of the nomad. In the situation they found themselves, words were of limited use and their di diary entries become very, uh, uh, very limited. Diary is extensive, but the latent photographs offer some solace they projected their own situation into the invisible space of the latent image. They are intensive. A boy humming a tune under his nose, as the Les Anglotari say in Thousand Plateau, the moment they become deteriorized or outlawed on the ice sheet, they adopted the intensive image as their art form. The field of Cartesian perspectival vision became distributed and overcome when they were in the balloon looking down at the earth rather than forward towards the horizon. This gesture of tilting the head down already suggests a different regime of vision, another experience of seeing. It is reminiscent 
of the immediately discarded first frames in the role of film. The feature that, that feature, for instance, the shoes of the photographer. This is another of these amazing images because that is clearly a still life. And the note from the diary is, we photographed the story of the development of our forks. I made a fork for Frankel. And that's how they were found on the White Island, um, which they uh, managed to drift to. Um, but they were trying to get to uh, Franz Joseph land unsuccessfully. Um, that's the, here are the diaries, and you can see they were trying to pad their outfits uh, with, um, with something. And maybe that's enough. Thank you very much. <laughs>